I think that I can introduce Xavier Cabaret by a metaphor. I cannot find any other words. I think he's the big bang of World West for the activities today and tomorrow. In the early times of the big bang, I think was his teaching of PDAs in this in the faculty, the works that can be mentioned by Joaquin uh, with Salam uh, Morales and so on. But then it came an inflation time, which is a, a PhD thesis of Xavier Ross and, and Joaquin Serran. And I believe, or it seems to me, that today we are in the discovery of the gravitational waves that are allowing us to see the early times of the universe and proving something, okay? So, I believe that his talk <coughs> goes very far away to when Jackson a long time ago. It's a work of the four people, uh, Alessio, uh, Xavier, and the other Xavier, and Joaquin, and I think this is very, very fitting to finish the lecture today. Thank you, Sebastián, for the, can you hear me well? Thanks for the introduction. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to, to have Alessio listening to the talk. <laughs> I'll check that you don't do your math. <laughs> um, and uh, maybe it's not for me to say, but if I was in another situation, I would be a little, I'm usually confident when I have to give talks, but I would be a little mm, worried or scared because of the previous talks, <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, the level of the previous talks. And I'm not sure if I, it will be at the, at, the, at the level. I'm sincere. But since, for instance, two of them were from my students, I'm very happy about that. <laughs> and I'm just happy. <laughs> if it's not at the level, no problem. Another day, maybe, it will be better. It, is, uh, it, is, it was not so simple to prepare because it's very technical. And, uh, but I hope it will turn out to be okay, and the audience also is not specialized. Um, I'm going to speak about a result uh, that I work for, uh, a conjecture that I work for 23 years, I think, 90, 96, beginning of 96, when I got uh, my, my second postdoc in Paris, so 23, and that we solved... Uh, we solved with uh, Alessio, uh, Joaquim, and Xavier. Uh, last, uh, well, the paper was finished last July, and you find it in uh, in archive. Okay, so I will explain the story maybe a little more detail later later on. Um, to start, um, to start, uh, I want to do just basics. That something that I think all all all, all here, all students can understand. Um, can understand and see a little, at least understand something of the problem, say, because proofs are, 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 are rather technical. Just a little bit at the end about proofs. So here we have the Laplacian or minus the Laplacian is a second order linear operator for fun acting on, sorry, acting on functions of n real variables. So x is a point in a domain in Rn, right? This is the Laplacian. And uh, first fact in, uh, in linear PDEs, but this already gives you some work, it's not, it's not so easy, but it's basic for us, is that the, the Laplacian is an isomorphism between two Banach spaces. There could be other choices, but I chose these Banach spaces, which are called holder, holder, uh, holder spaces. Here, C2 alpha means that I have a function that is twice, the, uh, twice the differentiable. And the second derivatives, partial derivatives, are holder continuous with an exponent alpha. Alpha always between 0 and 1, strictly between 0 and 1. And here I have to consider functions that vanish on the boundary. Then if you take a function like this and you make two derivatives, for sure you will get into this space continuous functions, which are more than continuous, holder continuous with an exponent alpha, so that that the Laplacian maps x into y is just trivial, it's just the definition. Um, but the important point is that it's an isomorphism. If you give me a function here in C alpha, there exists a unique function u, 
u in the space x, so it is a c2 alpha function uh, in the bounded domain. This is a nice, smooth, bounded domain that vanishes on the boundary. It's important to put this condition. And then you have uniqueness. And therefore, it's a solution of this problem. We write it like this in PDs. Uh, it's Laplacian, it's g, and it's 0 on the boundary. So this, this is a boundary value problem in PDs that we call the Dirichlet problem. And it's well posed. It has existence and uniqueness. And not only existence and uniqueness, uh, it's an isomorphism in the functional analysis uh, meaning, which means that it's not only bijective, but uh, it is continuous and the inverse is continuous. And being continuous and the inverse being continuous means two inequalities. So at the end, in PDEs or in analysis, everything reduces, no, not everything, but many things reduce to inequalities, right? This is the trivial one that I pointed before, and this is work. This is work, this is linear work, that is the Schauder theory that, uh, that appeared in the talk of, uh, of uh, Chavi, um, applied to then to nonlinear problems after linearizing them, right, in some way. But here we are linear. By the way, uh, do you know what happens if you put alpha equals, you, one would like to put alpha equals zero. Is the Laplacian, an, because it would be a simpler space, right, the ones that we teach in calculus two, uh, is the Laplacian an isomorphism between C2 and C0? It could be, but it is not. <laughs> it is not. So, um, so it's very important that alpha is, uh, is bigger than, than, than zero, all right? So, so holder spaces are very, very important. So let's go now to my nonlinear problem that, and, the, and the problem, the nonlinear problem that, uh, that our paper, joint paper deals with. This is the problem. It's still functions that are zero on the boundary. And, um, <coughs> and that now solves the minus Laplacian of u equals a nonlinearity that only depends on u. Not, there are no derivatives here. But f is a, what we call the nonlinearity, is a function from r to r, say. And lambda is a, param a real parameter. This is called a reaction diffusion uh, problem. Diffusion is the Laplacian. It's related with Brownian motion. And, uh, and, um, <coughs> and this is like a reaction, uh, a reaction term, a right-hand side. Uh, and these models like these appear in many situations in, in phase transitions uh, and com competition between two species, uh, in cosmology, uh, many, many in fluids. Uh, ir 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 rotational uh, incompressible fluids. Uh, also, you have PDs like this. So it's a quite basic basic uh, equation, or one of the most basic equations in nonlinear elliptic PDs. <coughs> so let's take f of zero positive. You can think of f of u equals the exponential of u. It will be an important example. f of u equals the exponential of u. If f of 0 is positive, um, then u, the trivial solution, u equals 0, is a solution only for lambda equals 0. If you take lambda equals 0, 0 is the solution. But uh, 0 is, only the only solution, is a solution only for lambda equals 0 because f of 0 is not 0. So now you can ask yourself, uh, are there solutions for other lambdas, non-zero? Non, non and of course, what the first thing you do is to think of basic calculus and the implicit function theorem. We are going to solve the problem for lambda at least small enough, around zero, through the implicit function theorem. And that's easy, right, uh, from the previous transparency. I set up the nonlinear problem uh, from this Banach space, C to alpha, functions that vanish on the boundary, the reals, and then y was C alpha. And, um, and the function psi is just the equation that I want to solve. I want to solve this equals 0. So I want to solve psi equals 0. Of course, uh, u equals 0 and lambda equals 0 is a solution. And implicit, through the implicit function theorem, I want to find u as a function of lambda for lambda small enough, right? And the, if I want to find u as a function of lambda, what I have to see is if the functional really depends on u. If the functional depends on u, after linearizing it, I will be able 
to, uh, to invert to find the solution. So what I have to do is the linearization with respect to you. Okay, so I perturb like Joachim did in his talk, say, uh, in Joachim it was u plus t phi, right? Here I will call it u plus epsilon psi. And, uh, and I write it like this, and now I collect terms without epsilon, terms with epsilon, and terms with epsilon square. It's very simple. And this will be the linearization acting on psi, on a perturbation of psi, the linearization of my original problem. Laplace is linear, nothing changes. This is nonlinear, I have to differentiate it with respect to u, it's just putting instead of f of u, f prime of u, and then multiplication by psi. So this is an operator. Now I go back to my point uh, u equals 0, lambda equals 0. This zero order term disappears because lambda is equal to 0. I get the Laplacian. It's an isomorphism. The implicit function theorem tells me for small lambda, you can find a unique solution of the problem around zero, small solution, and you can write it like this, u as a function of lambda, right? The nonlinear problem has a Lagrangian or energy behind. This is funny that I didn't talk to you, but in your slide also you use Lagrangian and energy. <laughs> um, so this shows that there is consistency between students and uh, advisors, which is, which is uh, good. And I put energy in quoted because in PDEs we call it energy. But in real uh, classical mechanics, say, eh, uh, or calculus of variations, you should call it the, Lagra the, the Lagrangian, right? And as in uh, Joachim uh, talk, it's like the Allen Kahn energy that he presented, Dirichlet energy that total la vida. <laughs> And then, uh, and then potential, uh, potential energy. But in my problems, I will not have this. I will not have this double well potential. But keep thinking of the model problem I told you. Uh, small f being the exponential of u. Capital F, the primitive. Capital F is a primitive. Also the exponential of u. So I will have lambda, my, lambda times exponential of v. Of v. This is the Lagrangian or energy. You do the first variation, the Euler-Lagrange equation. I can do it now faster because you saw already saw how to do that in Joachim's talk. And you will find the Euler-Lagrange equations. Critical points of the energy will solve my PD. Do it very fast, just perturb, write everything, just perturb, make the derivative with respect to epsilon. This is quadratic, it becomes linear. This is nonlinear, it stays nonlinear. I put epsilon equals zero. I get this expression. So quadratic, bilinear, zero order term. I integrate by parts, like he did. And I leave psi here uh, alone. Uh, this integral must be zero for every psi. This guy here must be zero. And you get the Euler-Lagrange equation. This is the first variation. And now I care about the second variation of energy. Uh, because I'm going to be interested in these states which are stable. We'll come to, back, we'll come to it later. But now it's much easier for me because Al Joachim already made the job. But let me try to explain a little. Well, the second variation of energy, I have to differentiate this still again with respect to epsilon. And put epsilon equals zero. And I find uh, the linearized operator, by the way, that we had already found here. Because here I had, this was the first variation of energy. And I'm making one more variation. So this is the first variation of the Euler-Lagrange equation. is the second variation of the energy. So I'm redoing, I'm redoing everything again. But I'm doing it on purpose because, because when I compute like in this way, I find the linearized operator, but I find it after integration. I find the quadratic form. Or I find, if you want, the linearized operator that I found uh, using the implicit function theorem applied to psi. But here it appears after doing a scalar product in the Lebesgue space L2. 
Let me put again u equals 0, lambda equals 0 as in the implicit function theorem. Well, this part here disappears, or this part here disappears, and I get a quadratic form, which is grad psi square, which is non-negative. So from this other way, more energetic, I realized that the Laplace is not only an isomorphism, but also it's a positive operator. If psi is not zero, this will not be zero. Psi equals constant is not allowed because psi has to be zero on the boundary. So the only constant is zero. So I learned that minus Laplace, it's a positive operator. In fact, it, minus Laplace, it has an infinite number of eigenvalues that go to plus infinity and they are all positive, right? They are all positive. Well, this is a theorem of PDEs, of PDEs eh? and functional analysis. So a solution of my equation is said to be stable if the linearized operator is non-negative definite as operator. If you want, you can check it in this way. Uh, do the quadratic form, which is an integral for every psi in the space uh, x vanishing on the boundary, this quantity is greater or equal than zero. This is the linear linearization of the prime, but it's the second variation of energy. Being non-negative, it exactly means what uh, Joaquin was describing, that I have a critical point which is like a local minimum of the, of the energy. And I wrote it in other ways, but similar to what <laughs> Joachim said. Well, they stable solutions correspond to critical points of the energy, which are local minima, more or less, philosophically speaking. And I wrote these are observable solutions, or solutions that persist under small perturbations. And that's why the catenoid, when stable, still doesn't break, right? <laughs> You perturb a little, and you are still um, you are still uh, you you are still there. Or you could think of uh, of a dynamical system. So take the equation and add u t minus Laplace u equals f of u. So at time, this is a nonlinear heat equation, and it becomes an evolution problem, like a dynamical system. If you have uh, if you have a, 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 a critical point which is a minimum of an energy, and this energy is like a Lyapunov function or something that decreases with time, then it's going to be stable in the sense if you perturb a little, uh, uh, the dynamical system brings you back, brings, brings you back to, the, to the minimum, all right? So, so it's, um, stationary so uh, stable solutions are stationary solutions that are limits as time goes to infinity of nonlinear heat flows after for instance, after perturbing a little the initial datum, okay, which is the stationary solution. Our paper, by the way, it's about stable solutions of this problem, and that's why I had to define uh, I had to define this. Let's continue. I'm not happy enough with the implicit function theorem. Um, well, I can use the global implicit function theorem, right? That says like a, a global version or a continuity version that says. Um, okay, this branch, as long as the linearized operator at, uh, at the solution that I found with the implicit function theorem stays positive, as it was in the beginning, that was minus Laplace, it will stay positive for some time by continuity. As long as it stays positive, the branch uh, will be continued through the implicit function theorem. So you continue like that but you realize that the linearization is very the linearized operator is very dangerous because um, because it is here and it will have minus laplace minus lambda f prime of u let's think of the exponential uh, this is the linearized operator okay this is positive but a lambda if lambda gets larger and larger uh, this guy may beat this positive because it's subtracting so at some point something may happen right <coughs> so let me get an idea of what can happen from a variational point of view let me uh, let me um, well the energy it's infinite uh, it's difficult to, to understand the energy because 
uh, okay, at Ulanda it will have a local minimum, but then this is, this there is a minus here, and this is exponentially growing, so the energy for sure will go down, all right, will go down. And, and, and in fact, my, my space where the, the energy is defined is infinite dimensional, so not so easy to treat, right? But let me get an idea just drawing the energy on lines, like, like, like what we did with the perturbations, on lines. Let's fix a function v. So here I'm not proving anything. It's just to give me some hints of what can happen. But I cannot prove anything like this. I must be infinite dimensional. But let me be for a second finite dimensional and draw the energy on the ray along a function. So you just fix a function and now take a real parameter t and write the energy. Well, this becomes a function of one real variable. We all know about one functions of one real variable. This is a polynomial, t square. Then there is the minus, there is a parameter, and there is something that behaves like the exponential of t. So now I can, uh, I can draw exactly the shape of this energy uh, in time for, for when the variable is t. For lambda equals 0 is a parabola. This parabola should stay locally for lambda small. So for lambda small, there is still a parabola, but the origin is no longer a critical point. It has, it has negative derivative. So the new solution is not, this, is not zero. It has to go to minus infinity. So, so something has to be produced here. It looks like a local maximum. But I'm not sure because this is in infinite dimensions, right? And then you realize also that when lambda is sufficiently large, uh, the derivative of this with respect to time will always be negative, always negative. So no critical point. Behind this, there is a theorem of... Um, okay, so this plan was, 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 uh, was um, studied or proposed uh, by Gelfand, and, uh, and there is a, a joint paper or note or survey Barenblatt, uh, of Barenblatt on the Gelfand problem. The Gelfand problem is when f of u is equals exponential of u. For more general nonlinearities, we'll, we'll call it Gelfand type problem. It's a problem that comes from a model, say, in combustion theorem, in when you put the exponential, the exponential of u. And uh, well, we will work always with this set, or most of the time, with this set of hypotheses on the nonlinearity, like the exponential, like the exponential here, f of zero positive. F increasing, convex, super linear at plus infinity. This is one of the models, and this is the power model. These ones are also okay. 1 plus u to the power p, p bigger than 1. Increasing, convex, and super linear at infinity. And now here I will consider lambda positive, say. It is not the, this was proved by a group of people, say. So and it's not, not so difficult to prove uh, this. It says, start from here, please, which is simpler. If lambda is bigger than a certain parameter lambda star, there are no solutions. That's what it was indicating my previous, my last drawing in the previous slide, right? And this parameter lambda star, we call it the extremal parameter. After, there are no solutions. Before, for lambda between zero and lambda star, there is a stable classical solution. For every lambda, there is, at, there is at least one stable classical solution. In fact, there is, there is at most one. There is, uh, being stable, it's, uh, there is a unique stable. It's the one that I found with the implicit function theorem in the beginning. And in fact, I could get them all with implicit function theorem. The branch is increasing with lambda. So these are functions that are increasing, increasing. And as lambda goes to lambda star, they increase to a function that now, well, what does it mean, classical solution? Classical solution, I mean, for instance, C to alpha, in that space, C to alpha, uh, in the space x. The limit, the limit is a point-wise limit. So mm, the limiting function maybe is not C to alpha. It's not uniform convergence, say. It just converges in L1. I'm able to prove convergence in L1 and get an L1 function that is a 
distributional stable solution of the extremal problem. The extremal problem is when lambda equals lambda star. This solution, u star, we call it the extremal solution of the problem. Then eight years later, more or less, nine years later, Joseph and Landren made the first, uh, systema uh, first uh, systematic study, more detailed study of the problem for the exponential nonlinearity in the radial case. In the radial case, the PDE becomes an ODE because the radial case means that you are in a, in a the domain is a ball and the functions are radially symmetric. So at the end, the function only depends on the radius. So um, the, the, the Laplace operator becomes an ODE, second order ODE, that you can start a study with ODE techniques, phase plane analysis, whatever you want. And what they found is this uh, picture, that up to dimension 9, they found the branch of stable solutions, it's this branch, at the extremal parameter they found a classical solution, and then the branch continued, because here the operator was positive, positive, here the oper operator becomes to have a first eigenvalue, which is zero, and bifurcation theory tells you this branch has co to continue, but to the left, and then they found they found that it goes to it goes to the left, and then starts spiraling like this uh, around another parameter lambda here that I don't care about now. And for dimension ten and higher, instead the solution, the branch, as lambda goes to lambda star blow up in L infinity norm. So this weak distributional solution, U star, the extremal solution, they could see that it was unbounded in the unit ball and for the exponential. I want to give you, I want to show you, but these were on, only ODE techniques. I want to show you a way to understand, to present, to tell you who is U star and to understand more from a po PD point of view why uh, why in this dimension U star is unbounded and tell you who is this guy U star. And this was done by Brezis and Juan Luis Vázquez in a paper that will come up later, a uh, very important paper in this, uh, in, this, in this business. To explain you that, to tell you who is this guy, um, I need to present you uh, a, a, an important inequality in PDEs which is called the Hardy, Hardy's inequality that answers this question. When is this operator non-negative definite or positive in a, in a domain of Rn? The operator is minus Laplace minus a constant divided by the distance to the origin to the power 2. This is a special operator. Why it's a special operator? It has some nice property. Because if you rescale scale, uh, space, if you pass from meters to inches or, or yards or whatever, <laughs> Uh, this rescales like minus 2, because these are two derivatives, so meters to the minus 2. And this other term also rescales like meters to the minus 2. So this tells you that there is some invariance under rescalings for this operator, and therefore there can be some interesting inequality behind this operator. And in fact it is. It is the hardest inequality and tells you whatever is the domain containing the origin, there is this inequality which is true for every function with uh, compact support in the domain. You need the dimension to be greater or equal than 3. And the inequality says, the Dirichlet norm of the total vida <laughs> controls the function in some way. So functions control controlled by derivatives, right? This is very common in PDEs. But now in this case, I have the same exponent on both sides, and I have this, uh, I have this potential here, uh, 1 over x squared. And here there is a constant. And the proposition also says this is the best constant in the inequality. You cannot put bigger constant. This is the best one, and the inequality is true with this one. So this gives an answer to this question. This operator will be non-negative definite if and only if the constant is not too large it has to be less or equal than the Hardy con what we call the Hardy constant, okay? Um, what did I want to say about this? Okay, when you see an equality like this, you have to check that it makes sense. 
for instance, the function psi equals 1 cannot be here because if you had constants, this would be 0 for constants and this is not 0, so this is not true. That's why I'm putting 0 boundary values. The, the function has to be, has, must have 0 boundary values or must have compact support somewhere. All right? And then the idea of the behind these inequalities, like the Sobolev inequalities, the, the, the gradients of the function, the derivatives of the functions, are able to control the function itself. The function will, cannot be too large if the derivatives are under control. Okay? It's like the mean value theorem, <laughs> but more sophisticated. But still, this one is the only one that I can prove for you in one line. Then there are these overlap inequalities and ma are much more sophisticated, but they, they look similar. But this one, one can prove in one line. Let me just give you the idea, but very fast. This seems to be complicated, but it's not so complicated if you use spherical coordinates. You write x as r times sigma, and r is the radius to the origin, the distance to the origin, and sigma are the angles, so sigma are in the unit sphere, and r is the radius. This could be, uh, in this I can suppose that I'm in all Rn because I extend the function since it has compact support, I extend it by zero outside. So it's the same in all Rn, and I'm writing in all Rn, and this is the, Jac here I put the Jacobian, you know in, in spherical coordinates the Jacobian is r to the power n minus one, but I have una another minus two, so n minus three. And now this is the trick, very simple. You write r to the n minus 3 as the derivative of r to the n minus 2, and you integrate by parts. And when you integrate by parts, the r n minus 2 remains here, and you have to differentiate psi square. And you get 2 psi, psi, derivative of psi with respect to the, ra to the radius, which is part of the gradient of psi. And now you see, oh, now I'm fine, because I will do Cauchy's worse with the blues, will give me this, and the reds will give me back to this square root, and I'm finished. Uh, well, I, one has to do the details, but it's very simple. Uh, in general, in PDEs, these type of inequalities are not so simple, okay? <laughs> but this one is nice and it's important. <clears throat> so now here it is. Uh, you try now for functions, radial functions, that could solve this uh, nonlinear problem. You try a little. You try powers. Doesn't work. Well, you try, uh, try a logarithm. I'm trying singular solution. So now I go back to the, we are back to the, to the question that appeared in the talk of Chavi. Are solutions, are solutions bounded? Is the extremal solution bounded or it's unbounded? Here I'm worrying, I'm, 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 I'm studying the extremal solution, which is the limit of a stable solutions, and therefore it's stable. So I'm mixing the two talks of them. Are stable solutions regular or not regular, right? Well, you try, and then like somebody was saying yesterday, uh, I don't know if Xavi or Joachim, it's very useful to have, okay, right? <laughs> Or this morning, no, no, this morning, or this morning. Sometimes it's very useful to have, and this can be useful to everybody, to have like an explicit solution of maybe a particular case of the problem that you are working with. If you have a very general problem, if you have for a particular case an explicit solution, it can be very useful and can, use, uh, can be used as a guide. For instance, this happened very strongly in my paper with Joan Sola Morales that uh, Joaquim uh, mentioned. And uh, so you try, you try, and here you try another one, singular one, very, very, very uh, standard, which is a logarithmic singularity. And then you can compute the Laplace, it's just an OD, you compute the Laplace, it's derivative with respect to R, two derivatives, uh, well, you compute and you are lucky, and you see that it solves the Gelfand problem with parameter lambda, lambda equals 2 times n minus 2. Wow, I found a singular solution. And now I wonder, is it observable or not? Is it stable or is these ones that are very, that we don't see in nature because it, it's unstable? Well, you do the linearized operator. 
this is linear, minus Laplace. The derivative of the exponential is the exponential itself. But the exponential of u is 1 over x squared. Here it is. The exponential of u for this solution is 1 over x squared. So this is a Hardy type operator. Is it going to be positive? It will be positive definite if and only if this constant, 2 times n minus 2, is less or equal than the Hardy constant from the previous transparency. And this means that n is greater or equal than 10. So this singular solution, logarithmic singularity, is stable in dimensions 10 and higher. And that's why it can be limit of the branch of stable solutions, classical stable solutions. Uh, in less dimensions, uh, it cannot be here because it's, it would be stable, but it is not stable in dimension 9, 8. And this anal so beautiful synthetic short analysis was ma first made by, by Heim Brezis and, uh, and Juan Luis Vázquez that I know. So, and again, we see the thing that uh, Xavi told us um, this morning, that in high dimensions, there are more chances to have singular solutions and less in, uh, in, small, uh, in, small, di in small dimensions, okay? Mm. So, after this, the question is now, okay, this is a particular case. It's the exponential nonlinearity and for the unit ball. What if I have another nonlinearity? What if I have another domain and my PDE is not an ODE because it's not radial? Solutions are not radially symmetric. So these are the questions. When are stable solutions, when is the extremal solution bounded? And therefore, once it's bounded, again, like, like in Chavis' talk, once you, I'm able to prove that the extremal solution is bounded by linear methods, I'm able to prove that it's C to alpha, C infinity even. So the point here is to prove if it's bounded or not. Because once it's bounded, f of u, the reaction term, which is the danger, is also bounded. So the right-hand side is bounded. The Laplace being bounded is a very strong thing, and I get more regularity. So this is a written for the extremal solution, or I could um, state it more generally, like Joachim, like when are stable solutions of this type of equations bounded? This is what I wrote here. This is the energy space, the Sobolev space, but I'm not talking about Sobolev space. So when are stable solutions bounded? Let's, let's write it like this. This is the PDE analog of the problem that Joaquin mentioned. That is the regularity of a stable minimal surfaces in RN. This is a very important open problem in differential geometry. Very difficult. Many people would kill for proving this. Uh, I think <laughs> geometers mainly, but also analysts, right? Why not? Uh, when are stable minimal surfaces, those ones that uh, we saw in the photographs of uh, Joachim, um, regular or not? It is known that it is not true in dimension 8 and higher, and mm, it is known that uh, it's true in dimension 3, but this is already 30, no, 40 years ago. And it's open, it's, it's, uh, it's open in these dimensions. It's like a little em embarrassing, but it should not be embarrassing. It is a very difficult problem, but uh, hopefully it will be solved at some point. For minimizing minimal surfaces, it is known that they are regular up to dimension 7, as Joachim said. So it's something that we know how to prove for minimizers. For stable, it's much tougher, all right? And here we are saying the same. We are seeing like the dimension instead of being 8 or 7, the cut dimension 7, 8, in our case should be 9, 10. But at this point, 72, it was only known for this nonlinearity and this domain. So now let me tell you the story. Let me tell you the story. The first result after Joseph Langren is by Crandall Rabinovitz some years later, 75. 
and they prove a nice result, the extremal solution is bounded, or every stable solution will be bounded. I'm writing all this for the extremal solution, which was the motivating problem. But the answers at the end say energy stable solutions are bounded if, what did they prove? If the dimension is less or equal than 9 and the nonlinearity is very close to the exponential, to exponential or a power, very, very, very close. In particular, if it's the exponential or a power, but also they, they, they could deal with nonlinearities which are quite close to them. Second derivatives also close in a way. Uh, so um, it's a very nice result. And this in every domain. So we are out of the ODE radially symmetric uh, setting. This for this I'm very happy. But still the nonlinearity, the nonlinearities are particular ones. <coughs> but that's good. Then, well, 75, 85, 95, 20, 22 years later, 21. It's when I arrived to Paris, and Brésis um, was very interested in this problem because of some progress they had made in the for the parabolic version for the evolution for the evolution version, and uh, he put it almost many people to work on it. Say Juan Luis, one of them, myself, I got very much interested, and some students of him. They have some papers where, uh, where they state uh, the conjectures or the open problems. The one with Juan Luis, there are like eight or nine open questions. Then Brazis wrote another one by himself. And these are some of the questions. Is the extremal solution always in the Sobolev space, H1, the energy space? Well, let's focus more on this. Brazis wrote, is there something sacred about dimension 10? Is it possible to construct a singular stable solution for n less or equal than 10 in some domain and for some nonlinearity? Is it possible or it's not possible? At that point, we didn't know very much what would be true. A student of Brazis proved that uh, regularity holds up to dimension 3. Very nice result, in fact. Um, it's something. And this for every nonlinearity of the type increasing, convex, superlinear at infinity. So it's good, good, good enough. Think of these nonlinearities increasing, convex, superlinear at infinity. And this was a nice paper of a student of, of, of Brazis. It was the th his thesis. Let's forget now about this other thing, since I don't have so much time. And then I had a, a paper with a PhD student of me, Antonio Capella, at that time. And we proved that in the radial case, regularity holds up, up to the optimal dimension 9 for every nonlinearity. This was for absolutely every nonlinearity. It is at this point when I start thinking that the conjecture should be true, that the question, that the, the answer to this question should be no. It is not possible to construct. It is not possible to construct stable solutions up to dimension nine, which are singular, because in the radial case it's not possible. And if it's not possible in the radial case, I have hope that 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 it is not possible in any domain. So uh, from this point on, I would call it the conjecture of the of of no of the Georgino of Brésil, say <laughs> of Brésil, say. So this was a good uh, progress. And then the most important one I did some years later. This is a CPAM paper, nice paper. And I could go up to dimension four. An interior, very nice interior bound, and up to the boundary if the domain was convex. Just keep that I could go up to dimension four with very, 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 very nice uh, estimate, uh, L infinity estimate. This is 2010, OK? Uh, well, Sal Salvador Vill Villegas in Granada extended uh, nicely my some of uh, my results, made some extension, very nice extension. I don't have time, I'm sorry. Then with Javier Rosoton, we could go up to dimension 7 for domains that we call of double revolution. Uh, you, keep, you split your n variables into groups, and all this part is radially symmetric, 
and all the other part is radially symmetric. So they are domains of double revolution. It's not an ODE anymore, and we could get up to, to two more uh, up to dimension seven. Uh, at that point, I thought uh, this problem is very difficult. I believe on it. I'm not pessimistic, but I need to speak to other people because <laughs> it's just like this. And then I spoke to somebody who liked it a lot and who is very strong, one of the strongest PDEs in the 20th century, Joel Sprague, who is still uh, in Baltimore, who is still doing very good job, very good work. We tried, we tried, but we didn't succeed. <laughs> it was not, we could go up to dimension five, but with a, 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 an assumption on the, on the nonlinearity that we were. That's not the point. The point is to try to prove it for every nonlinearity. And then this is our paper that you can find in our in archive, our result. It says, um, first, it's an interior estimate. Up to dimension 9, you have a beautiful L infinity and also holder continuity estimate. First, in the interior, this is how the paper st starts, like many often in, L, uh, in regularity theory. And then the boundary regularity. Here you see global regularity. If you have a stable solution, no matter what the nonlinearity is, up to dimension 9, you have uh, the estimate and solutions at the end will be C alpha and therefore C infinity, if you want. Here, there is only one assumption on the nonlinearity for the interior regularity. The nonlinearity must be non-negative. For the regularity up to the boundary, we need more. We need F to be non-negative. F increasing and F convex. The corollary is that the extremal solution is always in the energy space in every dimension and it is bounded up to dimension uh, 9. We have results in dimension 10 and higher but are not L infinity estimates because they, don't, they don't, do not hold in these dimensions. Can I have like two or three minutes? Two or three? Okay. Let me just give you a very fast idea of what, how the proofs work, just to give a flavor. They are quite technical. The first thing is to try to find an, a, a guy that solves something interesting for the linearized operator. Here in red is, what you see, is, is, is the linearized operator, and you see it when you write, this is the stability condition. I have two informations, the stability condition and the PD that says minus Laplace of u equals lambda, or here, forget about the lambda, f of u. I have this, and I have the stability condition, which is this. It is important to write the stability condition for psi being the product of two functions where c will play a key role. You have to choose c in the right way to satisfy something nice for the linearized operator in red here. So let me t tell you how C or how Psi was chosen in through the history of the paper, of the, of the problem. Crandall, Rabinovich, and Nedev didn't do this trick of writing Psi as C times eta. They directly worked with Psi that was a function of U. No derivatives, just a new function of U, and tried to find H appropriately, depending on F, to get some interesting information. And this could, and Nedev made it work up to dimension three. And Crandall Rabinovich up to dimension nine, but for nonlinearities very close to the exponential or to powers. Okay? So something else was needed. Well, the radial case was great to, to, to do the radial case because here, here, it's first time when it appeared this uh, decomposition. And the important thing was to choose in the correct way C as pretty much C is UR, the radial derivative of U. If U satisfies this PDE, the radial derivative, if I differentiate with respect to the radial derivative, here I will get F prime of U, UR. It's like the linearized operator. And here I have to commute the radial derivative from the Laplace. And I cannot commute it. There will be an extra term. So I can uh, expect the radial derivative to satisfy something interesting for the linearized operator. And this is the case. Unfortunately, 
it gives the optimal result, uh, regularity up to dimension 9. And the other part of the test function psi, la, the eta, it's uh, very natural to find, to find it with, with this proof as a power of the distance to the origin. To the origin. So this, at the end, this is the test function in the radial case. I don't know why uh, in the non-radial case for a while I didn't know what to do with this. And some years later, I could do the dimension 4 case with a very different test function that was the modulus of the gradient. And this is the key choice of C. Then after this, well, 10,010, it's all these years. Uh, it's all these years that there was no important progress. Um, but I kept working on it. Then like in 2000, uh, before you graduated, you, you graduated like 2013 perhaps, I made, I made quite a big progress. I, I made a quite big progress uh, and I told my students first only to try to keep it here, right? <laughs> and get the result here, but we were not able. I mean, it was a very important process that was almost solving the problem, but we could not get the L infinity estimate. It was frustrating, but we could not. And uh, we could not. And then I decided to, to go around the world and talk to some people, selected people <laughs> that I could trust, and that I thought that they were strong on these things. And I won't say names, but there were like four or five people, and we didn't succeed. But I I preserved, say. <laughs> and then uh, three years ago, three and a half, well, yeah, three, three and a half, I went to Zurich, and I explained the problem to Alessio. And he got uh, very interested by it, right? Captivated, say. And for a week, we worked together. I mean, I didn't force him. <laughs> I mean, I didn't force him. But he would come to my office almost every day. <laughs> and, uh, and OK, we realized some things, but uh, we could not solve it. And that's like three years, uh, three years ago. And then one year ago, I went to Zurich uh, for a conference uh, that uh, Joaquim, Javier, and Alessio organized beautiful conference uh, at the ETH. So I was there for the week of the conference, and I stayed one more week. And I was stubborn, and I said, um, please, uh, could you, uh, Alessio, Xavier, and Joaquim, come all together to my office on Monday, or Tuesday, maybe Monday, I'm not sure. Uh, doesn't matter. Mm, because you all know this problem, and uh, if we add uh, force, right, and inputs, uh, there will be more chances. And I think already the first day we felt good. We went back, we went to lunch or whatever, uh, feeling good. <laughs> you were there, Matteo. <laughs> you have to think that I had worked on this problem for 23 years, right? <laughs> So, but we were, uh, we were feeling good, but no, no, no big deal, say. On Tuesday, we started feeling better, right? And then after three days, uh, we could see that we were getting very close or we almost had it. Uh, and then I remember having my plane on probably on Friday and uh, in the afternoon and sitting on a table just to go faster, sitting on a table next to Alessio. They had to go to teach, sitting with Alessio to make some, some, some details, right? Technical details that we were quite convinced that they should be OK. But we, had to, we want to check. And then Alessio, uh, uh, impressive Alessio, took <laughs> his speed to check the details. And I had to say, OK, I have to go to the airport, but, uh, uh, but yeah, everything is fine. <laughs> so I went very, very happy. So for all this, thanks, Alessio. Thanks, uh, Joaquim. Thanks, Xavi, because you all contributed very importantly. And, um, and uh, it makes a lot of sense that you are a doctor honoris causa for, for the UPC, I think, at least from my point of view. So thanks for your attention. By the way, in our paper, we need to use both Cs. Uh -huh. <laughs>
that one that seemed to be the good one but i couldn't i didn't know how to use here we use it and it's the first one we use and it's very very important but then at the end we also need this one and these are what they satisfied for the linearized equation Oh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, I'm forgetting something. If somebody wants to ask me something that I should be saying. Well, Matteo promised that uh, that there was something after the figalata, right? <laughs> that I learned from Alessio during lunch that figalata, for Spaniard or a Catalan, when we understand figalata, it's funny, right? And sounds like figali, figalata, like something coming something nice, something strong coming from Figali. But in, in, in Italian, figata, figo is something beautiful, bonito, figo. And figata is una cosa bonita. And, and so, so when, they, when an Italian says figalata, um, uh, it means uh, figali, but something very, very bonito, right? Uh, nice. <laughs> And then the day we, we solved this, or one of the days we solved this, then we went for lunch, very happy, I think, quite happy. Uh, and then I said, uh, Alessio, I'm going to change a uh, name. I mean, you, you contribute so much solving this problem. It's so good. I'm going to change your name. Uh, let's see if you like it or not. Instead of Figali, I will call you Fields Gali. <laughs> 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 and that was kind of funny also. Of course, um, mm, at that point, you had not won the, the Fields Medal yet. Just? Ah, this was right after the Fields Medal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it would have been nicer even if I called you before, like saying, OK, <laughs> it was right after. <laughs> yes. Well, so thank you very much. Sure. Thanks for the attention. Thank you all for attendance, and thank you, the speakers, and thank many thanks, Alessio, for coming. Uh, it's been really a pleasure to have all of you here. Really, really interesting, all the talks, and, and I have enjoyed very, very much. Thank you to all. Thank you.